Sure, someone can tell you that you need to post three to five times a day on social media and you need to document everything. That's great if you're someone who is single without children and you have a bunch of money saved up that you can hire and outsource all that out. But if you're a parent and you're, you know, transitioning out of this job and you've got children and bills and households to take care of, you don't have access to those same resources and they don't have the limitations that you're dealing with. So that playbook is just not going to work for you. And so I really strive to help my clients figure out what's the playbook that they need to create for themselves. Introducing Ali J. Taylor, a trailblazing entrepreneur and inspiration leader, passionate about bringing people and ideas together. As a two-time founder, seasoned consultant, TEDx speaker, and podcast host, Ali has a proven track record of championing small businesses and entrepreneurship. At the forefront of Wisdom and Wayfinder, Ali guides businesses and individuals in achieving growth, profitability, and scalability through effective systems, strategies, and relationships. Ali's contagious enthusiasm and genuine kindness set the stage for creating meaningful connections and driving positive change. Outside of work, Ali delights in the simple joys of life, indulging in Reese's peanut butter cups and savoring a fine bourbon. Join us as we dive into the remarkable journey of Ali J. Taylor. And thank you so much, Ali, for being here today. It is such a pleasure to have you. And I'm so excited to just dive into your journey, but I'm so curious to start off. What inspired you to start your first business and how did that experience influence the creation of your second venture? So what inspired me to start my business, I mean, I've always had a little bit of an entrepreneurial freelance spirit. So the last time that I had worked for someone else was about 2015 or so. And it was for a marketing agency and long and short of it, without getting into too much drama or details, just had a different idea for how I wanted to approach work in terms of I've wanted to be more connected with the clients, with why are we doing certain things, as opposed to just selling whatever website package or marketing package that we could for just to meet some revenue goal, I really wanted it to be something that made a difference for the client. If me designing a website or doing some type of marketing package for someone meant that they could leave the office earlier and go spend time with their kid or go make it to the baseball game or to the dance recital, you know, I wanted to keep that in back of my mind as a motivation for why we were doing those things. And it was just a different way of working than what the current owners of that company were really interested in at the time, you know, in terms of the freedom and being able to come and go, I was able to work ungodly amounts of overtime. But if I came in late in the morning or, you know, 30 minutes late, it, it seemed to be an issue. And that's just not the way that I wanted to approach my work. I was more afraid of staying than what would happen if I went out on my own. And that was really the impetus for me kind of taking that leap off the cliff and building that plane on the way down. I love that. And I, I love that you mentioned too, because I feel like a lot of people feel this way at least that have leaped from corporate and like working a nine to five into entrepreneurship, at least in my circle, where it's like, you feel like your back's against the wall or you're in a box and you're like, yeah. I want to get out, but I want to use my creativity, but I feel like I'm really stifled in this situation. You might have the best boss, best work environment, whatever it may be. But then if you're late, then it's an issue. Or if you're just like a few minutes later, you need to take some personal time. It really keeps you confined and restricted to allow you to actually spread your wings and fly. And I love that you took that leap of faith and entrusted that even if it was scary, but it became so uncomfortable that staying in that uncomfortability was more worrisome than actually going out and doing it on your own. And I think that's where a lot of people feel in that moment. Did you like, it sounds like that's what you felt. Yeah, that's precisely how I felt. But what's interesting and sort of funny now, or maybe it's a sense of irony, is I've had people come to me now who say, I want to do what you do. I want to, you know, start my own business because I'm frustrated with where I am. I'm not really happy and not really fulfilled. And in this conversation, I was like, sure, you can do what I can do, but are you prepared to take the hits and the disappointments and getting kicked in the face on a daily basis that came with the way that I did it? Or can you try something else that might fill up that bucket for you that 
increases your tolerance for maybe the ways in which you're not happy at this job, but it gives you the stability that you're looking for or the stability that you really need in terms of aspects of your lifestyle that you need to maintain, right? It's much different to try to maintain certain aspects of your lifestyle while also building a business for the first time ever and figuring out those things on two fronts. It's like, you know, you can try and do that, but I don't recommend it. <laughs> I'm glad you said that. I see. I wish I knew this when I started because it's like, yeah, I'm just going to jump in, see what happens and couldn't maintain my life. <laughs> but nor here nor there. But I think it's just a lot of challenges that aren't spoken of because we see on social media, oh, I worked for my laptop from the beach and I made X amount of money and I, it was an overnight success or I was able to make six figures in six months. And yes, that happens, but it's like the 1% and it's yeah, also it's if you have rare. a network and all the other things. Yeah, it's very, very rare that someone has that kind of success. And if they do, they're definitely leaving out aspects of the process and what they had in the background. I always tell people, you know, be careful of the advice that you're following online. Be careful of the gurus that you're listening to because you don't know what resources they had at their disposal. You had no idea what team that they had access to. Sure, somebody can tell you that you need to post three to five times a day on social media and you need to document everything. That's great if you're someone who is single without children and you have a bunch of money saved up that you can hire and outsource all that out. But if you're a parent and you're, you know, transitioning out of this job and you've got children and bills and households to take care of, you don't have access to those same resources and they don't have the limitations that you're dealing with. So that playbook is just not going to work for you. And so I really strive to help my clients figure out what's the playbook that they need to create for themselves. We can follow the principles, but don't necessarily follow the prescription of how they're doing it. Because again, we don't have access into seeing all the things that they're working with. That's really true because you're right. Everyone has their own playbook. There is just so much research and knowledge and books and podcasts and all the gurus out there that are giving us a lot of advice. However, it's going to look different for everybody's lifestyle. And I'm curious because you work with a lot of business owners in the entrepreneurship world. What are the most common challenges that you see people and even yourself that you've had to overcome in this process? Yeah, the biggest challenge is alignment and vision. So mm -hmm. when I started out leaving that other job from 2015, the first two years or so, I went out with like a chip on my shoulder, like, I'm going to prove them wrong. I'm going to show them what's what, like they're going to regret this. Like I'm going to be this big success. And that's a great motivator for getting started, but it's not sustainable for the long run. The business cannot be sort of your personal playground for your vendetta, for you working out the limiting beliefs and the doubts and the stuff that you have going on. You really have to take some time to go deal with those things. And so it wasn't until I really dealt with that. And then even in relationship with my father at the time, like wanting to prove him wrong and wanting to make him proud of me. It wasn't until I dealt with what was my intrinsic internal motivation for why I was in business. What is it that I wanted to accomplish and how did I want to do it? And until I put aside realizing one, those people from that old job, they've moved on, they're living their life. They're not thinking about me at all. So why am I letting them or my perception of them or my perception of their perception of me impact how I'm running my business? And then with my father wanting to make him proud, it's like, that's great. And that's not the, the core driver for my business. It wasn't until I was able to resolve those things, put them aside, that I was able to actually triple my revenue after that. And then that's when my father was able to tell me that he was proud of me right? When I stopped seeking it. So. Yeah. I love that story because I think a lot of people internalize a lot of things or externalize it. Everybody's different. And I know you have a really different approach with how you consult. And I know you incorporate inner child techniques and stuff. It's not really talked about a lot, but yeah. I love that you do use different modalities and ways to help your clients. And can you give us an example of what that looks like and how you help people in that capacity? Yeah. And just to preface, I 
did not go to school for any of this. This is just part of my own personal journey and evolution of what I've been going through and how I've been evolving myself and healing certain aspects of the relationship with my inner child. And so a lot of the different programs that I've gone through, personal professional development programs that I've gone through, one of them currently is called the Nice Guy Reform School with Ashley Cox, where men who have been successful in so many other areas of their life but not necessarily in their romantic or intimate relationships with women. They come in and they learn how to heal the relationship with themselves so they can actually experience that level of success in all areas of their life. And so it's through the combination of going through programs like that, reading a number of different books, just doing a lot of mirror work, affirmations, meditating, the whole gamut of everything that you can imagine for a person to heal the relationship with themselves. I bring a lot of that to my conversations because I just have that level of empathy and listening for what's really getting in the way of my clients sort of taking actions. They want to be successful. They want to have the growth and the business and the revenue coming in, and they're not sure why they're getting stopped in certain areas. And one of the things that I'm really good at is being able to sort of explore their blind spots with them and listen and hear what's really at play here, whether it's something that has to do with ego, it has to do with some area where they didn't feel worthy. A lot of small businesses and solopreneurs aren't asking for the money that they really desire and they're not pricing their services in a way that's truly reflective of what the market will actually bear because there's some place where they don't think they deserve to be that successful or to ask for that much. And so when I start to see that come through, it's like, oh, that's what we've got to go deal with first. Then you'll start doing the actions that we've assigned that we started working on. And I love that you said that, like you're a lifelong learner. And that's what I, I hear as well, just constantly evolving and growing and really taking what's at face value, but digging deeper and seeing where what's not being said, the blind spots. Mm -hmm. I mean, I love that being a former therapist, being able to like see and kind of pick apart a little things, but being there to support and also creating that space for your clientele to really identify, okay, maybe they need a therapist, maybe they need that extra aspect, but just being able to have that fundamental like piece of understanding, okay, well, there's something more here and kind of taking a step back before you dive into the business stuff, because it could be ego, it could be other things that are happening, especially the difference between men and women. There's a lot of differences. There's a lot of similarities. And I think it's not really talked about with men in particular about inner child healing and things like that with women. Yes, but I haven't heard it as much. I'm sure it's going on. I just haven't been exposed to it as much, but I think it's amazing that we are talking about it and knowing that we're all human at the end of the day. We were just talking about that before we started recording because it is at the end of the day, we all are human and how we function through the world is going to be a little bit different, but we gain the knowledge when we don't know something we don't know, unless we're actually actively seeking that and working through it. And you're a prime example of that for your clientele as well. You've done the work and now you're just paying it forward as well and continuing to evolve yourself as well. Absolutely. I believe that the best coaches, the best leaders are people who consult with other coaches and constantly keep themselves in that state of elevation and improvement. Not that you're seeking for what's wrong, but it's like, if I'm always looking for what's possible, right? And that's really the space that I'm coming through is like, what is possible for my clients? What is possible for the people that I work with if we get all of this other stuff out of the way? Right. Most of the people that I work with, they're already brilliant. They're already talented. They're gifted. They're empathetic. Like the way that they like to work, they're absolutely brilliant. And there's just some stuff that's in the way. Right. Or they just don't have the systems or the processes in place that allows that brilliance to really come forth. And that's really where my function is to come in and be able to point those things out or hold up a mirror or just give a, a listening ear for that stuff to get expressed so that now it's like, okay, cool. I express that it's off my plate. It's off my shoulders. And now I can go for it. Yeah. It's just lessening the load. This is like, yeah. what I pictured was the world's on your back and it's like, okay, I just need to take like a piece off <laughs> one at a time, <laughs> one at a time. But I, I think that's the beautiful thing. We can continue to evolve. We don't have to do it all at once, but it's just taking it in bite sizes and steps. And there's so much wisdom that you do have. And part of what your podcast is called Wisdom and Wayfinder. How did you come up with that name? And tell us a little bit about your podcast. 
Yeah. Uh, I'm still trying to figure out like, so, okay. So the wisdom part of it was, and this really comes out of the loss of both of my parents before I turned 40. And it was like the idea that we don't have enough time. We don't know how much time we have, but I know that we don't have enough time to learn everything there is to learn about running, growing and scaling a business on our own. And so we need to borrow from the wisdom of other people who have been there. Like that's how you shortcut it. Right. And you can be prideful and stubborn and obstinate and say like, no, I'm going to figure it out. Or you can just do the smart thing and just ask other people who have been there. And so it was really kind of born out of that loss sort of running as an undercurrent and realizing that I'm surrounded by a lot of really smart people. I can just ask them, you know, and most people are, you know, especially those who are really successful, they're generous with their time. They want to help people who are motivated and want to move forward and really achieve something. And so those people are happy to be generous with their time. And that's what I've really found with the guests that I've had on is that they're generous, they're successful, and they're successful because they're generous with sharing what it is that they've been through and what they've overcome. And so that's really where wisdom and Wayfinder as a whole, as a business came through was, again, borrowing the wisdom from other people and then finding your own path. That's really what it's all about. It says on the front of my website, you know, find your path to growth and profitability. Because again, the playbook that most of us are operating from is outdated, not designed for us and not created with what our intrinsic motivation is. And so if you try to play by somebody else's playbook and you're successful at it, I can't think of anything that is more sad than succeeding at somebody else's game, right? To win at a game that you didn't even want to play or to climb to the top of the mountain and realize it's not the mountain that you wanted to be on. Well, yes. And just letting that sink in because I know I've had so many people in my life, they're no longer in my life, but that are like, mm -hmm. that have a, I'm always right attitude or like, yeah. you have to do what I do because this is like going to propel you forward or just mm -hmm. how they approach it might be different in that capacity. But sometimes it's from a caring place. Sometimes it's like, well, you don't see what I see. And I think yeah. it's looking at how can we uplift everybody? Everyone has their own path. And I love that your focus and all the key takeaways too, just the wisdom that we can pull from each other, just all the things I'm gaining from you right now. And that's why I selfishly love my channel, being able to interview amazing individuals like yourself. But I think that's the bigger part. The more we bring people together and hear different perspectives, the more we can broaden our horizons and see, okay, this worked for them. It might not work for me, but I can take a little piece of that and apply it in my way because it's not reinventing the wheel, but it's being able to expand it in what feels right for us because what feels right for me might be different for you and vice versa to somebody else. So I think that's the bigger picture of looking at, we can always carve our own path. And that's the beautiful thing of owning a business, entrepreneurship. There's a lot of ups and downs. However, there's a lot of success <laughs> and just with all this success you had with clients. Can you share a success story from one of your clients that highlights the impact of your guidance and expertise? See, one of the clients that I'm working with now is a brilliant writer, playwright, author, ink slinger, if you will. And we're working on a plan to help him get away from his corporate job just because he's done brilliant work there. And, you know, I think last year he structured a deal or something that saved a bunch of people's jobs, brought in more revenue in a quarter than the company had seen at some point. And still his job was in jeopardy because of just, you know, corporate, whatever it is, you know, whatever the mindset is there. And so we're working on a plan to extricate him from that so that he can do what it is that he really loves, which is also helping people be their own chief storytelling officers, right? Be able to tell their stories in a way that's intrinsic to them and what it is they really want. And so we've crafted a plan for him to basically replace his corporate income completely so that he can just sort of live off of that in retirement and do all the things that he actually loves. And we're about halfway through the year. And I think we're probably going to hit a little bit early. We'll see. We'll have to go back and do the numbers again, but I'm really excited about just the freedom that he gets to have inside of that. And then the freedom that he helps other people create because he's helping them write that great 
novel that they've always wanted to do, right? Helping people in sort of their third act, if you will. Oh, I love that. It's just like giving back, but also seeing the strengths that he has and also being able to replace that income. So it's not just jumping in because we all have mm -hmm. bills and a lifestyle to maintain yeah. basic needs. I mean, I saw a graph the other day of the United States, which is how much it costs to live in every state comfortably as a single person, as a family <laughs> poor. And I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> I like, know. We'll make that. <laughs> No, no. And it just, it just keeps going up. And so, yeah, we've had to adjust certain plans because of just how quickly things have skyrocketed in terms of costs and inflation and everything like that. But again, that's just part of the deal of being an entrepreneur. If you're going to take this journey, you've got to take everything that comes with it. And there's going to be the stuff that you can prepare for. And then there's the stuff that you can't prepare for. But how can you sort of train yourself to you know, come back to center, come back to calm and get back to the vision. It's like, okay, the way forward that I thought was going to work isn't working right now. And, you know, it's not because of anything that I've done, but I've got to be responsible and figure out a different way. I can't stay in that moment and sulk and cry about how unfair it is, or just give yourself five minutes to do that and then put on some badass music and move forward. <laughs> Yes, I love it. You know, it's interesting because my husband and I have this conversation all the time because we're in the solar industry and we call it the solar coaster. Um, <laughs> months are great. Some are like, oh crap, maybe I got to go back to work. But like, I mean, they yeah. play off. <laughs> I think it's that aspect of how things can really shift depending on the economy, inflation, mm -hmm. but just being prepared for that and knowing it's like, okay, yeah, right now might be really tight, but I know the wave's coming again. So it's just like mm -hmm. that constant knowing you have to ride the wave. And that's just like what I pictured when you were talking about that, because it's true. Some things are going to happen that are completely out of our control. Mm -hmm. Other things aren't. But a lot of times we can't control the economy. We can only control our own economy and making sure that we're doing everything and prepared in the best way. It's not for the faint of heart. <laughs> no. <laughs> anyway, I, I've had to learn the hard way, a lot of that aspect. But, you know, I want to go back to the podcast because I know you've interviewed yeah. a lot of people already. You're growing it. You're really making all these amazing connections. And I think that's a big part of just entrepreneurship in general. Even if you're not in, like directly helping somebody, you could indirectly be helping them or connecting people. I always think of that stuff, but I'm curious because how do you think entrepreneurs can leverage relationships and networks to accelerate their business growth? That's 100% what entrepreneurship and business growth is. It is all of the money that you want, all of the relationships and opportunities that you want are going to be in somebody else's pockets and in somebody else's hands. So if you're thinking that you can just show up and kind of do it on your own, you're sorely mistaken. And if you're thinking that you can do it without having a heart of service and a desire to give, 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 receive, and then give some more. Mm -hmm. That's typically the formula that you have to go through. But yeah, if you don't have that as the center of how you're going to show up, you're not going to be successful. People want to know that they're doing business with someone that is looking out for their best interests. Sometimes even if that means that it's not going to serve you immediately, it's going to work out in some way in the long run. Right. And you have to have a long term vision for this. So if you're thinking entrepreneurship is a quick way to make six figures overnight, I just highly request that you do something else. <laughs> do something else and leave this lane clear for those of us who really do have a heart to serve and want to build and develop and nurture those relationships over the long term. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. I think it really is that quality relationship, being able to have each other's back, be able to continue to grow together because I think we're better together. And the more that everybody's succeeding, it's like kind of everybody comes up. Even if one person's a little more successful than the other, it's just reaching back. Like it's, I don't know if you've ever seen that meme or graph where it's like a person's climbing the ladder, but like they're making sure every person is going to versus yeah. just like kind of going themselves because we move further together versus just one at a time. Yeah, absolutely. There's an African proverb that says, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. And that is truly a part of my ethos is let's go far together. Like let's do it as many people as possible. And that's part of sort of one of the long-term visions for what I have for my life is really to create like a whole foundation that really 
focuses on giving to small business owners and entrepreneurs and those who have that desire for it, access to resources and training and mentoring that I didn't have when I first started out. A lot of it, you know, was kind of, like I said, learning it and getting kicked in the face on a daily basis. All the books that you see here behind me, reading all of those and, and a couple more that are out of sight that you can't even see, you know, a lot of it was just sort of incurring that knowledge as I went. And I would like to sort of shortcut that for others who are interested in entrepreneurship and really see that as a path to their own independence and freedom. Speaking of the holiday that's coming up, I really think that entrepreneurship and small business ownership is the backbone of our country. And so I want to be able to invest in and pour back into those who have the heart and desire for that, giving them the resources that I didn't have and also for investing into public libraries. My mother worked there for pretty much most of my life. I even worked there for a couple summers, you know, putting the books away, but it was like having access to knowledge and information and being able to utilize it in a way that makes sense, I think is really going to be the key for everything that we're coming up against in the next few years. Absolutely. That's so well said. Because you're right, it's about just giving, 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 and then you receive eventually, but it's not giving to receive, it's giving because you want to. And I love the idea of your foundation because I was going to ask you, what are your future aspirations? But that's like huge. And I mean, that's a huge part of why I started this channel was because I struggled seven years ago trying to find a community, trying to find the tools yeah. I needed and just having incredible people that have been through it already can share their knowledge and wisdom and you can get those bite sizes and everyone says things in different ways it might be the same thing but how we internalize the information and really absorb it is so different too and going back to like giving and the value that you add because you're adding value in so many places on the TEDx stage as well in another place yes. but <laughs> can you tell us that process how you got there and a little bit about your talk too that was a fun, fun experience. I'm so grateful for that. I remember that whole day just being in a space of gratitude and even still now. So I knew that when I started Wisdom and Wayfinder, coming from a decade of marketing experience, I wanted to use public speaking as a way to enhance the visibility and really grow my business at a fast pace. This is also how the podcast sort of sprung up out of nowhere. I was doing a lot of the Facebook lives and trying to put content out there. And then I started interviewing people. But I sent an email out to my list saying, hey, I'm looking for speaking opportunities. If you know of any places, any associations that are looking for that, you know, these are the topics that I can speak on. This is what I do, et cetera. And so I got an email from Robert Hazelrig, who is a design colleague of mine, probably one of my mentors in terms of looking up to the work that he's done. But he sent me an email from Brookdale Community College, which is where I graduated from. They were looking for TEDx speakers. They were doing a call. And so their theme was, are we there yet? And I submitted a pitch video basically saying, are you going to like who you are when you get there? I got accepted. And then that's when the process of really like doing the research, formulating the full talk and everything came into place. And I borrowed from my favorite band of all time, Incubus, to sort of craft certain aspects of the talk, which is titled, Make Yourself Being Good With You in a World Full of Comparison and Uncertainty. And so I kind of talk about, you know, a little bit of the inner child healing stuff and just all of the ways in which we need that personal alignment and that vision for ourselves to really create who we want to be in this life because there are so many different entities and organizations or just groups of, you know, people and friends or just all these different things that will pull from your attention to try to get you to do different things that may not be aligned with who you really want to be in the world. And so sometimes that comes with a cost. You might get kicked out of the tribe, so to speak. You might lose a friend group or you might lose relationships or opportunities because you're being true and authentic to yourself. But until you're being good with who you are, you're not going to have the strength of character to be able to resist being pulled in so many different directions, whether it's through advertising and TV and all the messages that we're getting on the media, especially if you want to be a business owner and you want to build something that's actually real and sustainable and have relationships that truly matter. You can't do things the way that 99% of the world is doing it because just look around at how that's functioning right now, you know? 
And so that was really kind of the meat of the talk for TEDx. And yeah, the whole experience that leading up to it, most people are just going to see the 10 minutes of the video that, that gets posted on YouTube, but they will not see the hours of preparation that went into developing the talk and then practicing and rehearsals. But they're also not going to see the 15 years of who I had to become just to be the kind of person that could step onto that stage. I love it. I love the topic because I think it's something that I know I struggled with in the beginning of just being authentic to me because I was pulled in so many directions of like, okay, well, this is what I should do based off of everything I saw online or just like the advertising I was seeing. But I think the more I've stepped into my voice, my thought leadership, who I am as a person, the more certain friends have kind of dwindled and gotten removed from my circle because they no longer align with where I'm at. There's people that are still very aligned with me, even though we're in completely different stages of life or anything like that. But I think other people do struggle with this so yeah. much because it's like you've had a friend for so long and then you start becoming a small business owner and start moving into the entrepreneurship world. And they kind of are like, well, what are you doing? And they'll support people they don't even know, but then maybe not support you. And I've heard it from so many people, not just like me yeah. personally. I've had a great support system, to be quite honest, but a lot of people don't. And I think it's something to really, do you like yourself? Are you yes. standing in who you are? And I love that. And I did watch it like when we first connected, but it's been a minute. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so I need to rewatch it because I do think it's so powerful of how we can really communicate with ourselves and be transparent and honest with ourselves and where we're at. As long as we're doing good in the world, it doesn't really matter how it kind of transforms. And it's sad when things kind of dwindle or get removed from our lives, but it's making space to become who we really want to be and who yeah. we truly are to the core. Yeah, that's definitely one of the hardest lessons that I've had to learn was really, you know, and this is where it all just comes from. It's just really getting like solid to the core, like this is who I am and I've got to be okay with that, even if nobody else is. Yes. Right? Not that I'm going out and intentionally trying to instigate or irritate other people, but, you know, sometimes that's going to happen because when you are authentic and other people are accustomed to wearing a mask or pretending to be something that they're not, in order to be safe or be a part of the group or to fit into what they, again, going back to the playbook, right? Yeah. This is what they thought that they were supposed to do in order to be successful and to be happy. And they realize that they're not any of those things. They're not happy with the life that's been prescribed for them by so many other people before they even had a choice. And then you come along and you're not doing any of that. You're saying, no, forget that playbook. I'm going to go do my own thing. Sometimes it can either inspire and liberate others, or it can sort of irritate and convict them in a way. And so you have to be prepared for it to go either way. And you can't allow yourself to be swayed either way, right? You can't allow yourself to be swayed by the naysayers. You can't allow yourself to be swayed by those that are complimenting you either, you know, because both are, both are traps. Oh my gosh, such a good point because it's both spectrums, but it goes back to being solid in who you are, what your mission is, because that won't waver. Like, of course, influences can come in and if you let them, but I agree, like even the compliments, don't take that out of space value because they can easily turn. <laughs> I mean, we've seen it with just like celebrities and other things, but you know, you've already given so much insight, but I'm really curious, entrepreneurs that are starting out, somebody who's like, I want to start my own business. What advice do you have for those individuals? Take it slow. <laughs> Truly, take yeah. it slow. Take some time to really connect with why you want to start a business. It really has to come down to something bigger than just the money, just the accolades, just the freedom. It really has to come down to a bigger vision beyond just your own personal wants and desires and what you think it's going to give you access to. So yeah, slow down and take some time and figure that out first. Everything else is just systems, it's processes, it's, it's math, you know, it's been figured out for hundreds of years before you, people know how to make money, all that stuff, that's easy. But you figuring out why you want to do that, that has to be the primary work and only you can do that. Yes. Speaking of the why, what do you think helps 
those entrepreneurs that are taking it slow, they take that advice. They're like, okay, I'm going to take it slow, step by step. But what keeps them motivated and resilient? Like I know a why is a big reason, but is there other things that help people stay motivated? Yeah, I think if there's like a problem in a world that you just can't be with, like every time, you know, some version of that problem comes up, you're just like, man, somebody should do something about that. Well, guess who's somebody, you know, if that's something that you really feel called to and it really irritates you in some way, like maybe that's like your higher self in some way or some aspect of who you truly are sort of giving you the nudge that, hey, this is a way that you can use your gifts, your talents, your energy to make an impact on that. For me, it definitely comes up in the space of, you know, I do want more freedom, more entrepreneurial freedom and generational wealth and home ownership for most people, particularly for black and brown people, minorities. I think that is the fastest path for us to really have the generational wealth and freedom that you know, our ancestors did. Like when I look back at some of the historical events that have taken place, when I look at the Tulsa massacre that took place in the Greenwood area and just all of the wealth and the independence and the freedom that was created in a time that was really terrible for black people in this country, what was able to be created in that environment. I think if we can bring that spirit back to now, would just make a huge difference in, you know, people that look like me. And so I definitely want to be an inspiration and a, a role model for young black boys who look like me, who can't play basketball and sports is not a thing. And, you know, maybe being a rap artist is not a gift that I have, but I do want them to know that there are other ways to be successful and to create the life of your dreams that are outside of those two aspects. Love this because I think it is so important to have representation of all different walks of life, all different backgrounds, and little boys and girls to see people that look like them, no matter yeah. what the background is, where an ethnicity. I know as one of my core values is diversity, inclusivity, because I think the more we showcase different types of people, different backgrounds, the more we make that awareness of, okay, you don't have to just go down this path because that's what everybody else did, or that's yeah. what you're known to do, or whatever it is. Like, I mean, because I'm Jewish, and it's like, I'll be a doctor or a lawyer. Like, you know, like it's yeah. <laughs> those things, but I think it's looking at how can we really educate people of what's available, especially children. I mean, now more kids are on like YouTube and TikTok and all the other places as well, but it's just giving that awareness and knowing that no matter what you set your mind to, you can do and having that impact that you want to make in this world, no matter how old you are even, because there's kids that are like, I saw the other day an article that an eight-year-old bought a house and I'm like, what? <laughs> I was like, we need to talk. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> but, how did you do that? But I'm just saying it's like not limiting ourselves no matter what. And I think it's just, you said it earlier, the possibility, knowing what's possible, yeah, continuing what's possible. to put that out in the world. And the more we have amazing speakers like you talking about this, the more we bring awareness to it. But even with all of that, because speaking of the future and just what children are looking at and seeing, what trends do you see shaping the landscape of small business and entrepreneurship? in the future generations. I hope it's the trend that I'm really, you know, that I'm sort of pushing forward is that it comes down to personal alignment and vision, letting go of this playbook that we've been given of what it looks like to run a successful business and what it looks like to make money. My mission is to really push against all of that, and especially this idea that you have to work yourself to exhaustion that you have to choose between running your business, growing your business and your family time. It doesn't have to be that way. And this idea of this whole rugged individualism, pull myself up by my bootstraps kind of mentality. And that's the only way to be successful. I am actively pushing into all of those different narratives because I've seen what it's done to a lot of people that I've admired and respect. I think it's time for a new page. It's time for a new playbook, one that works for everybody and one that uh, people get to create on their own. I'm just going to be thinking of like playbooks. I, I feel like it just puts it in perspective of everybody has their own playbook and yeah. honoring that and respecting that, even if yeah. it looks different from ours, you know? Yeah, oh. exactly. Oh, but I've been so enjoying this conversation. I feel like I could be on here for a couple more hours, but... <laughs> 
<laughs> I just appreciate you being on today, Ali. Where can people find you, find your services? We're going to link everything below, but if you could let us know too. Yeah, absolutely. If you just search Wisdom and Wayfinder all together, you will find my website, wisdomandwayfinder.com. That is the name on Instagram. And you can also follow my personal Instagram, which is ajtaylor317. And yeah, any place that I can find a stage, I will try to be there as well. Amazing. Well, thank you again for just taking the time, giving us all your insights and well, not all of them, but most of them <laughs> that were so helpful in order to just help other entrepreneurs that are on this journey, not feel alone, but having gaining the wisdom that you bestowed on us today. Thank you so much for being here today. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Make sure to like, subscribe, comment below. What was the biggest takeaway from Ali today? I'm sure he'd love to see that comment and we'll see you on the next episode.